So Joel's someone who trains six to seven days per week. And now he mentioned this to me that you actually don't do that for the most part. How do you train? What's your training frequency like? Let's start there. How many, how many times a week are you in the gym usually? No, I would say that, that typically I'd be in there six days a week. Yeah, if I've done a cut for months and months and I've been in there six, seven days a week, plus doing, you know, cardio and all that on top of it, then I'll, I've kind of learned to take a break. I never used to, never a period in the year that I'd take off, but I've learned to off the back of a really tough period, have a few months where I might be in the gym four days a week. But if I'm taking it seriously, like I've just started to again, then six, seven days. And do you think that's important for muscle growth specifically? Is that why you like to be in there more? Or is it just more enjoyment? Maybe it's both. It's not enjoyment, Kenny. Mm. No, I'd much rather be doing other things. Like, don't get me wrong. As soon as I stop going, I want to be there. But six, seven days does put a lot of pressure on you time-wise. It's hard to fit other things around it. So it's so much easier to stay in shape if you're there that long. Because if I'm training well, then I find it a lot easier to, to eat well. You almost feel like you're letting yourself down if you have trained and eaten crap. So that's got a lot to do with it. Naturally, you're burning a bit more energy. So it's easier to stay at a decent body fat level. And I think that it's quite easy to slip, for me anyway quite easy to get out of shape if I'm not committed 100%. Even like if I'm relaxed, I know it's a lot healthier than a lot of people, but it's still very easy to get out of shape. Okay. So you find that when you're doing the four day per week training that maybe your nutrition kind of gets a little bit floppy. Is that a bit is more that relaxed? A bit more relaxed. Maybe that's a better yeah. word. Yeah. 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 No, actually you're right. Sloppy. We can say that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, a little bit sloppier training. I guess it's hard when you when you don't have an end goal. Like you've just you've just finished a cut, you feel like you're done, and then it's tough sometimes to stay that committed. Okay. I can see how that could be the case once you've reached that goal. It's almost the journey's a bit more actually the, the journey is more enjoyable, the process to achieving the goal, and then you almost have to find a new goal as quick as possible, or it starts to go a little bit downhill from there. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that goal becomes finding the best arm and croissant, you know, <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to swap it out, but it is good to relax and make time for those other things, you know, whether it be holidays and whatnot. Sure. Outside of just being at the gym. Absolutely. So let's say someone only does have four days per week to train and yeah. they want to maximize their ability to make progress in the gym. How did you do things at that time? And would you say you made progress with four days per week for you specifically, by the way, that's uh, important to mention for the listeners? Mm. If I was starting from scratch, I would make progress four days a week. But where I am now, uh, I'll just maintain at four days. There'll be zero progress. So I just make sure I'm getting every muscle part in. Train the same as if I was doing a four day split and repeating, but obviously having those rest days in between. So yeah, I'm content with being able to maintain for a few months at a time. Let's say you're in a period where you are trying to grow muscle and you're taking it serious. You're training six days per week. How do you adjust your nutrition for that? Do you tend to eat in a surplus? Are you okay with putting on some body fat? Yeah, I'm not too afraid of it. I mean, it's definitely less enjoyable. I've learned over the years that my surplus is probably everyone else's maintenance or even deficit amount of food. So it's not, it doesn't take me much to eat in a surplus. I'd back off cardio a little bit. I would focus more on maybe slightly lower reps and maybe a little bit longer breaks. Whereas if I was dieting and trying to lose fat, then those rest breaks really shorten and the reps are higher, more intense. Very old school, right? The way they adjust the training and yeah, actually the training and even the rest periods when dieting versus gaining muscle. Yeah. Yeah. But it makes a difference. I think a lot of, especially natural, we'll stick to that. That's what this podcast is dedicated to. Natural bodybuilders, they get a bit afraid of maybe doing that because they think they need to maintain heavier loads to maintain their muscle. What's your take on that? Because clearly you're not doing that. Yeah. What's your experience been with the adjustment of 
decreasing the loads and upping the reps and decreasing the rest periods, something that a lot of natural bodybuilders are actually afraid of when they're cutting. But I can see how it could make sense and the value of that, even from an injury prevention standpoint, because when you're less yeah. calories, there's definite pros there. But I'd love to hear you maybe elaborate on your personal experience. Yeah, sure. I'm never, ever afraid of dropping weight because typically, you know, if you can get, say, 10 reps out doing 30 kilo dumbbell press, for example, you're likely going to get 12 to 15, just dropping it by two and a half kilos, for example. And that two and a half kilos, you're still in agony at the end of the set. That should be the aim anyway. You should be training until failure. So it really shouldn't matter if you're doing 15 kilos or 30 kilos. But yeah, as I said, the weight that I'll drop to happens naturally, but it's only a fraction of a drop. Yeah. And from the get go, I've never, I wouldn't have a clue what my one RM is on anything. I've never pushed for heavy weight. I couldn't care less what the person next to me is pushing because, you know, naturally when you start, your weights will kind of increase a bit, but then it pl naturally is going to plateau. You can't keep increasing that weight. And I don't know if that's the case if you're not natural or not, but I know for me, my, the weight that I've moved has hardly changed for years. And as soon as I try to increase more, that's when I, it doesn't feel as good. There's more strain on my joints. I don't feel it as much in my muscle. So I'm very happy to, to kind of stick to that level. That's very interesting. So you essentially let the volume influence, I should say, the progression of overload over time. So like you'd mentioned, you notice that you kind of maintain on four days per week muscle, but when you go to six and you're increasing your volume over time, that you start to notice that you are filling out more, maybe growing muscle tissue. I mean, we never truly know if we're growing new muscle tissue unless we're like getting that tested in a lab or whatnot. But yeah. you, you, you have personal experience with some of the signs that you're like, wow, I look like I'm growing, doing more. Is that is that accurate to say, Brock? Yeah, I think so. But like you said, it's so hard to it's so hard to know without a control and regular testing. And you know, your diet's probably changed a little bit. And then as, as you get leaner, you feel like you're growing. So it's yeah. True. You look bigger, but maybe you're just a bit leaner. Yeah, you, I mean, sometimes, you may have even lost some muscle, but you look bigger. But you look better and bigger. Yeah. And uh, I mean, sometimes you have the before and afters where you're at a similar body weight and you see that well, I look better at this body weight with this specific plan I've been on. Well, that's a pretty good sign, I think, for people who might be listening yeah. that want yeah. to use some sort of objective measurement as best as we can, right? Like, like you said, if we're not in a lab and testing it, we don't really know at the end of the day. But so what specific split do you prefer training split because with the six days per week are you taking a day off like is it three on one off or is it six in a row or do you just yeah usually it, that's that's when it's most intense i'll do a three-day split and then saturday or sunday i'll take off i'm two or three weeks into it, my latest cut if you will and i'm changing it a, a little bit so i've done it numerous times and each time i think I've, i'm gonna nail it the next and i'm gonna tell you the same thing i think i'm gonna get it right this time i'm kind of gently tapering from where i was which where i might might have been training four or five days a week to now doing a, a four-day split and repeating and then i'll move to a three-day split where i do chest and back and then shoulders arms and legs by the second rotation, when I'm meant to do legs, I'll use that as my rest day or I'll do longer session of cardio instead, just because I think the older I get, the less my legs can handle that pressure. And I don't probably, unlike 90% of people you'd speak to, I don't want my legs to grow anymore. I'd, I'd be quite content if they trimmed down a little bit. Okay. Yeah, that's um, a good look too. I find that the classic physique, I, you know, I, not the modern day classic physique, but we're talking like even the 70s and maybe 60, mm. uh, 60s for sure. I think the legs were not overly big and just humongous legs that like the Tom Platt's look. I don't know if, you, you know, people are afraid of having skinny legs that they think that they need to do yeah. so much. Right? Yeah. But, yeah. And Tom Platt's legs were so impressive, but I, I'm not going to get there and <laughs> I'm happy to admire from a distance.